Welcome to a special edition of Unpacking Coffee. I'm Ray. And I'm Candace. This week, George Howell, elder statesman of coffee or cold-blooded killer? We'll find out after the break. Said George Howell knows his coffee. George Howell, he loves his coffee. Welcome back. <laughs> this is a new feature on Unpacking Coffee where we focus on individuals. Yeah. Today we're talking about George Howell, the man, the myth, the legend. So we went to SCA this year. The Specialty Coffee Association Annual Expo, Expo in Seattle, Washington this year. Right, and we had a chance to Try George Howell's coffee. But I also got to take a class from George. And he was showing us the difference between stale coffees and bright coffees using his green coffee freezing innovation. And there's a huge difference. George Howell is an innovator. So last week we talked about George Howell coffee. This week we're talking about George Howell, the personality. Yeah. I get very excited about things, whether it's art or coffee or whatever, uh, and I need, I have the deep need to share. Yeah. <laughs> we opened the first one, it was a great choice, in the middle of Harvard Square. Mm -hmm. So the students are coming every which way and through. And we became an overnight sensation. April 9th, 1975. Yeah, I remember I almost burned all the hair on my head off the first day we roasted. We learned the hard way. We had the fire department come in several times over the first several months, and this cloud would go up, and on a particular low, a low atmospheric day, the cloud would descend on the building next to us. The next thing we know, the fire department was there with their axes. Every roast, I remember, I'd brew a cup uh, in an automatic machine and drink the cup to see what the next roast would be like. Yeah. That's how it started. I needed to prove to people that we were roasting coffee. So we posted the roasting on every single barrel and on every bag and made that point that the coffee was roasted and we roasted several times a week. That's in 1975. Right. Decades before others were doing. The fact that we were trying, that we had more information than anywhere else, and these cool coffee makers that were on the shelving and such, just people people loved it. Yeah. And they flocked to this to the to the coffee connection. When I sold the coffee connection to Starbucks in ninety four, it was sort of a relief. We saw Starbucks coming at us like a freight train. Right. right? We were gearing up for that. There were five countries, right? And I was the consultant for just one of them, Brazil. Gift from the skies to me, mm -hmm. because Brazil was the most looked down upon country for coffee. Mm -hmm. Although many spe specialty people sold it, right. but it was a blender and that kind of thing. Brazil is 30, 35% of the world's production. They have the most professional people in the business. So I was gifted with a person called Silvio Leite. Yeah. Uh, who was spectacular. Everything was a well-oiled machine. Cup of Excellence really was spending for those two years traveling and seeing a lot of farmers, mm -hmm. talking to them. Uh, Brazil is like 95% the size of the United States. Vast areas, so you're driving days sometimes, going to these different fairs and speaking to hundreds of farmers at a time about quality and a lot of Brazilian farmers kind of laughed at me and said, you Americans, you talk a big game, you talk all quality, but you're nickel and dime us to death. Nevertheless, I was received with yawns, or yeah, it's better, but it's not 25 cents better. That is something that will be recorded in my memory forever. Well, that's what came to my coming to this idea of a competition. The idea was then to bring them, invite them to Brazil to spend an entire week uh, ensconced in a place separate from everything where they cupped what we would have selected, we would be selecting as the best coffees Brazil had to offer. 
So we brought 20 cuppers. Already we had had a national jury that had selected through 850 farm samples, right. right, for a month beforehand. And the way we got them was by offering them 10 cents better than the market price if they won the Cup of Excellence. At the end of the five days, every one of those cuppers who had entered kind of like, who knows, were blown away. People who had been selling nothing but Brazils, it was one of them was an importer, said he had never been in a room of that kind of quality in his life before. The whole scoring sheet for Cu Cup of Excellence uh, came out of reading wine books and about those competitions and such. A year into Cup of Excellence, I created that sheet, which really became uh, the model for the SCAA CQI mm -hmm. cupping sheet today. Yeah. I did the competition piece, came up with that concept, uh, and the great heroine in the story is uh, Susie Spindler, who, who will, without, without her organization, <laughs> never would have happened. Yeah. I mean, Susie and I would often talk about, we felt like a bridge. Mm -hmm. We were bridging producer to, to, uh, to roaster. Then the question became, how do you sell that? What happens if the Japanese buyer and an American buyer want the same, like the first prize one? Mm -hmm. How do we sell it to them? Auction. Yeah. So that's Cup of Excellence in a nutshell. So that's the story of George Howell before he founded George Howell Coffee. And George Howell Coffee is covered in our last episode. George Howell. So let's talk to George about what he sees about the future of coffee. I would like to see, in the long run, farmers become independent of roasters. There are craft-driven farmers who, even if they're selling a loss, have the need to produce something great. I would like to ultimately see them as equal partners, equal powers, where there truly is a give and take. Today we still have a paternalistic system. Yeah. The whole thing, from fair trade on down, is paternalistic. And we, the buyers, still own the market. There's a very, there's a handful of farmers that can say otherwise. We have, again, reached a kind of flat position with a few superstar coffees. Again, typically the geisha variety is one of them. Uh, and now different processes are becoming involved, right? With, uh, different yeasts and who knows what else. Uh, so specialty coffee is expanding not only in improving the quality of coffee and working with farmers, but also going in 50 different detours in different directions at once. Yeah. So it was an absolute thrill to meet George Howell and tell you a little bit about his story. Uh -huh. Well, so we'll see you on the next episode. Happy birthday, Ray. George Howell loves his coffee. George